Um, we had uh, the Fellows Christian Day School Incorporated, uh, located in Decatur, Georgia. It's a private Christian elementary school incorporated in South Carolina, and it conducts a great deal of its operational activities and offices in both Florida and Georgia. In addition to prescribing a curriculum centered on Christian values and beliefs, its charter requires that its staff subscribe to a particular set of religious beliefs, including resolution of employment disputes according to a uniform chain of command. All employment contracts provide in relevant part, quote, all staff members must agree to present any grievance to the supervisor and to acquiesce in the final authority of the Fellows Christian Day School Board of Directors and forego pursuit of a civil remedy in court. Patty, who's 24 years old, was completing a paid internship at the day school. As a day school employee, she was required to sign the employment contract. The completion of the internship at the day school is a prerequisite for her master's degree in early childhood education at Georgia State. Patty has earned her undergraduate degree in child psychology as well from Georgia State. She has substantial student undergraduate, sorry, she has substantial student loans because her parents who live in Florida still claim her as dependent on their taxes. As a result, she could not qualify for in-state tuition. She was born in Florida and lived there until she moved to Atlanta to attend Georgia State. Her college sweetheart is Beyonce Brad. Moved to North Carolina after earning his degree in finance. He has leased an apartment in North Carolina and has a position at Bank of America as an assistant branch manager. After proposing to Patty to apply for a transfer to the Bank of America branch in Georgia, Patty has applied for several teaching positions in Georgia and North Carolina. No a month before graduation, Patty discovered that she was pregnant. Aware that this event would probably contradict day school's religious doctrine, she consulted a lawyer to determine her options. When the school learned that she had consulted an attorney, it terminated her internship for violation of its stated dispute resolution policy and because out of wedlock pregnancies came into direct conflict with the religious doctrine and set a bad example for students. Bad Patty. All right, so um, if you look at the sheet that I gave you, sorry I can't use the overhead, um, and determining whether or not there's subject matter jurisdiction, um, it's pretty obvious that there's federal question jurisdiction, sort of. Um, you see, you can argue both sides. Um, uh, the first one say yes because the First Amendment protects the right, uh, it's right to terminate the plaintiff if the claims arise under uh, 1331. So since it's a First Amendment issue, meaning religion, deals with the First Amendment, that's a federal statute, you could make the argument that yes, you can get the case in federal court, um, subject matter jurisdiction based on 1331 federal question. Again, because you're dealing with a uh, constitutional amendment or a federal statute, which in this case is the First Amendment. Um, so that's, of course, what the defendant would argue. The plaintiff, on the other hand, who remember, she initially filed her case in state court, so she wants to keep her case in state court. Um, so the plaintiff's account because the First Amendment is raised as an anticipated defense, remember the Malay doctrine, the Malay uh, case, um, rather than a plaintiff in her complaint, it does not rise under the Constitution um, as a 1331 federal question um, issue. So I think the strong argument um, is uh, the plaintiff's counter argument that uh, the First Amendment is, is an anticipated defense rather than uh, the basis of the claim. Um, but of course, in an exam setting, you get credit for both. Uh, but I just wanted to make sure um, that you see how federal question jurisdiction may apply um, in this particular scenario. Um, any questions about federal question jurisdiction? We're not going to talk about it again until we are examined here. Okay, remember you're applying to a treaty as well. Yes, Olivia. Can you just very, very briefly go over and the defense? Um, yeah, so it's just, it just means, so if I say there's a, a claim for um, negligence, and the defendant says, no, 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 uh, the reason I was negligent is because um, I was on FMLA, FMLA leave, uh, family medical leave, act. I was on leave based on that statute. So it, the, the basic claim is negligence, but it's a defense that you're saying the reason we were allegedly negligent was because of the statute. So it's an anticipated defense. In this case, it's the First Amendment. So it just means that the plaintiff's claim is a state claim, and has nothing to do with a federal, one of the, it means that the plaintiff's case is a state claim, but it's not based on a federal statute, it's not based on the Constitution, it's not based on a treaty. Um, but the defendant defends themselves based on one of those things, meaning based on a statute, based on a treaty, based on a constitutional amendment. It's an anticipated defense. But again, to get the case in federal court based on federal question, it needs to be based on a federal question. It can't be based on a defendant's defense to the lawsuit that's been filed against he or she. Okay. Um, so, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Um, For the wrongful termination, mm -hmm. wouldn't that be like under the Federal Human Rights Act and perhaps they've also... Yeah, yeah, so um, for the wrongful termination act, um, it's your choice. You can bring it based on a state employment law statute or a federal Title VII review law. Um, so keep going. So you just make the argument both ways? Yeah, so you that? just make the argument both ways. So the thing about civil procedure, like pretty much all your law classes, with a few exceptions, some of the courts are pretty clear about assault and battery, um, but it's never quite that cut and dry. I mean, typically you can't argue both sides, which is why you need an attorney in there and the judge will make the decision. Um, it's very rare that it's just going to be one of the two. Um, again, not an essay in this class, so starting the first week in April, we'll just be doing practice multiple choice. I just want to make sure you understand the context before you try to do a multiple choice question. If you don't understand the law, you're going to get it wrong. Um, but for future classes, the classes that do have essays, they want you to do what he said, and they want you to have a discussion with them. They want to see that you don't get your hand in just a second, that you consider all the options in terms of possible claims, counterclaims, different approaches. Yes? Um, this is more kind of general. Um, when we're answering short answer questions, like, I love the way this is set up with different subheadings, but it's not written like full three paragraphs out. Like, is this something that's acceptable to you? 100%, yes. Yeah. So if we have short answer, it won't be more than five questions, but I'll limit, like, you can only respond in five sentences. So it'll be literally a short answer. <laughs> all right. Okay, diversity jurisdiction. Um, so we're going to remember we have in matters where these uh, domicile citizenship is the parties, where the plaintiff or defendant. Um, I'm not going to go through and read that whole thing, but essentially um, arguing that uh, the defendant, which again is day school, um, is domiciled in South Carolina um, because it's incorporated in South Carolina. Remember, businesses can have two domiciles, their place of incorporation or where their main operation is. If it's a small business like Google Day School, uh, they're probably going to have their main operations and place of incorporation in the same state. Um, it just depends. Um, and then as far as Patty is concerned, uh, the obviously is arguing that Florida is not her domicile um, because she doesn't live there um, and she hasn't lived there for the past five years and for the other reasons that are listed. Um, and the same thing. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time in the domicile because I'm just reading, reading the facts that are already in the fact pattern and doing that on your own. But what's important is in trying to determine um, diversity jurisdiction, you have to figure out the domicile. So you're always going to look at the facts and make uh, your strongest argument for whatever states uh, are mentioned in the fact pattern. Here we have Florida, um, North Carolina, and Georgia. Um, again, you're looking at um, where they currently reside and their intent to remain indefinitely. So the intent to remain indefinitely is where the argument comes in. Well, they, does she intend to stay in Florida or Georgia or North Carolina? That's the fuzzy part. Um, that's the not clear um, cut quick-cut response or answer. So again, in determining domicile for individuals, it's uh, where they reside, where they intend to remain indefinitely, and then incorporations have those two uh, approaches. Um, and whenever we're trying to determine um, diversity jurisdiction, so again, you're looking at the citizenship of the party, which is determined by their domicile, and um, is the amount in controversy um, over $75,000. Here it's $76,000, the answ
So I'm, putting, I'm coordinating this program, right? And I need to make sure the room is full um, because I want it to be successful. Um, it's today from 12 to 1 p.m. Um, it's called Everyone Matters. Um, it's part of the diversity committee's uh, <coughs> programming mandate from the, the dean. Um, so I like good food. So it's uh, Mark's Beef. Um, it's it's uh, cold chicken, cold pork, baked beans, potatoes, salad, green beans, brownies, and sweet tea and lemonade. We can afford pop or so depending on what part of the country you're from. Um, I will have a civil procedure sign up sheet. If you come, um, I will add, and it may not sound like a lot, but I will add two points to your final grade. The reason that matters is if you're on the border between an A and a B, those points matter because you know how the curve works. At some point, there is a cutoff. Um, if the room is completely full and you can't get in, then sign a sheet and I'm still going to give you credit for trying. Um, but 12 to 1 today in this room. Yes, I'm desperate. Ding. Okay, so. Uh, professor, can yes. you get a contract for 12 o'clock? Of course, yeah. if you want to be. Come on. <laughs> I have a sign sheet right there. Take to that table. Yeah. Right. He wants to buy. <laughs> <laughs> the food might be, you know, it's going to be now that is, but I mean, you can't. Who's, who do you have a contract? Oh, he doesn't love me. He likes me. I'm going to tell him <laughs> All right, um, Tabitha, are you ready today? Yes. Um, oh, you're still in the cluster. Why? Huh? Oh, I'm just going back to April because I was breaker. Yeah. So, Tabitha, we're not, we're, I'm not asking you April questions. Oh, okay. Yeah, no reason I'm asking you today is because you had the traffic issues last time, so we really didn't get to it. You know, yeah, okay. I'm not April. Yeah, you're in the cluster. I'm like, please help me. It's like a nice chi environment, right? <coughs> it should be fine. Now, come on, you're almost done with the semester. There are two L's, basically. Um, one L's and less two L's in mind. All right, um, so, my choke does not work. That's really I'm okay with that. That's a good person. We'll have to do it. Oh, that's exciting. Um, are we upset about the Louisville basketball game? Nope. Yeah, the lady cards are still in it. Um, did, who was the, the Cinderella team? Murray State for a minute? Oh. <laughs> did you go to Murray State? Yeah. Okay. I hope so. Um, <laughs> so who's left? UK. The Spartans are still in it? Yeah. All right, go green. Anybody else? What? All right. So, um, we left off with the last class um, talking about the Iqbal case um, in Standard 8A2. Um, the rule of law for Iqbal, just as a reminder, um, is that in deciding when to grant uh, defendants uh, 12B6 uh, motion to dismiss, um, again, which challenges the plaintiff's failure to satisfy Rule 8A2, the court will use the new standard, which is the plausibility standard, um, meaning the plaintiff's complaint um, must allege facts that plausibly support, meaning it's more plausible, it's likely to have occurred, um, the plaintiff's claim such that the court can make a reasonable inference that the defendant is liable. So, again, the plausibility standard requires uh, that the plaintiff's complaint uh, must allege facts, not legal conclusions, so must allege facts, not legal conclusions, that plausibly support the plaintiff's claim such that the court can make a reasonable inference that the defendant is liable. Reasonable inference. All right, um, so our next chapter, oh, I should have left that up there, I that up there. sorry. Um, so our next chapter, um, chapter six, I believe, um, deals with additional pleading requirements that are required for certain types of cases. Um, in addition to the general plausibility standard that we saw in the Iqbal case, um, there's also some additional pleading requirements depending on what type of case it is. Um, so we're going to cover the Stratford case um, because it highlights um, some of these special rules under Rule 9. Um, and so today, oh, I wish I had my list. Keep disappearing. So um, we've got Attorney Douglas, and uh, we have, um, what do you call this? Have I called on you Attorney Walsh yet? Yes, awesome. Uh, have I called on you Attorney, I think I've gotten everybody almost, yay. Um, Bearden? Sorry. All right, so Bearden it is. Douglas Bearden. And since we have a lot of cases today, um, what about Attorney Healy? Oh, yeah, I was for All right. Make sure you decide for the class. <laughs> like, so Remember, you did really well, though. That was a really hard case, so you should be happy about that. Because um, I, I, I did not do well in that case in law school. I didn't understand it. I, I'm volunteering. You want to be, you want to be tribute? I'm good. That's no fun, because the whole point is you're supposed to know you're prepared. That takes away the... Okay. Um, <laughs> all right, sorry. so we've got Douglas Bearden and... Um, Kempe. Baxter, if I'm calling you? Yeah, you want to call them. Okay, so I almost got everyone, so I'll finish up the last few weeks. All right, let's go then. Bearden and Douglas. Um, which of you are kind enough to give me the facts, please? Uh, again, uh, Dr. Stratford is a dentist who maintains an office in Staten Island, New York. Mm -hmm. um, he's failed to pay required insurance premiums for his building. And, they, and uh, Norman canceled the policy from October 10th, 1999 to December 13th, 1999. And then December 6th of the same year, Dr. Stratford submitted a no claims letter, meaning that he had no reason to use the insurance um, until October 19th. And uh, on December 14th, 1999, he was notified by the insurance company that <coughs> the coverage would be canceled. Uh, oh, never mind, sorry, wrong date. He was notified of reinstating it on January 9th, 2000. And then 10 days later, he made this huge claim on leaking in his building and his equipment being damaged and so forth. Okay, excellent job. All right, so I'm just going to highlight what she said, um, to make sure everybody heard it. Um, thank you for being detailed with the dates, because they are relevant. Um, so this dentist, we know, is super shady, right? He's trying to get away with some insurance fraud. Um, and it's so ironic, I have a family member um, who uh, got mad at um, his wife, right? And called the insurance company to separate their um, insurance policy. They each have a car, and he said, I want it separated. Um, we're separated. Didn't tell her. Um, and so then they ended up, you know, I guess he thought he was going to leave and decided that he was going to stay, but he forgot that he separated the policy, and he had it going to a friend's house, the new policy. And so he got what? Ran from the back on his birthday. Brand new 2019 truck. And he called, got a police report, called the insurance company, you know, just not even thinking, because the, how could you not realize that you had an authority? Got your, that's okay. Um, 
I'm like, how did you, how did you not know he wasn't paying the bill? And she said, oh, it's been an automatic withdrawal, you know, out of debit. And he thought he did, but he didn't. And so he called to make the claim with State Farm. They're like, you haven't been covered. He did it November 15th um, since then. You, you, I mean, January. So the accident happened March 8th. And so he lies and says, I never canceled my policy. Da, 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 da. So State Farm calls my cousin, the girl, and she's like, he left a message. What should I do? Like, you know, she's like, I didn't even know that he was planning on leaving me. She's like, she's like so now she wants to like screw him over, right? Um, <laughs> but yet they're in this happy space. So she's just like, she's all confused. And she's like, I got to call them back. And so, you know, the insurance company called her and she said, um, did you cancel? Did you separate the policies? Well, no. Um, did you know they were separated? No. Okay, so it wasn't, it wasn't your intention. So she did lie because it's insurance fraud. And that's all they asked her. She hung up. So now they're trying to decide the underwriters, you know, basically he's saying it was a mistake. I never said to do that. Um, and you, why would you do that? I mean, we're married. Why would I split the policy up? And they say, we have here on our notes the customer service rep that took the call that you asked for because you said you're getting separate. You were separated from your wife at the time. So it'll be interesting to see what State Farm does. Um, I feel like this, like the shady doctor, he's outside the claim period. Um, and, you know, don't, don't do the coverage. And so this dentist is like the shady cousin's husband. Um, he basically um, allowed a policy covering his business premise to lapse. Um, when the weather turned uh, poorly, the pipes in his office, um, as Attorney Douglas stated, uh, burst um, and damaged most of his office, including some really, really expensive dental implants. And so he responded by asking the insurer to renew the policy, again, offering written assurance that, listen, during the lapse, there's been no type of damage or incidents that have happened. And then, of course, right after the policy is renewed, shady dentist files a claim alleging that the damage occurred a month earlier than it actually had within the time period in which um, he was covered under the policy. Um, and really, what went really south here in this particular scenario is that the dentist made a very bad tactical error, error excuse me, by upping his claim, as Attorney Douglas alluded to, from $150,000 in property damage to more than a million. You don't think that's gonna wave a red flag? Are you kidding me? Um, it allegedly lost profit. So surprisingly, the insurer paid. I would have. Um, but with this interest apparently peaked by the larger uh, claim, meaning over a million dollars, um, they continue to investigate um, the situation to see whether or not um, they should have just claimed coverage. Um, so who sued first, um, Attorney Bearden? Right. Um, the um, plaintiff can just sue the dentist in state court because they're getting paid from a million. Excellent. Yes. Um, so dentist Stratford um, sued in state court. I believe it was one point two million. Um, why did the insurance? What did the insurance company do once it sued? And I'll go back to Attorney Douglas. Um, once uh, he sued the dentist, we would actually report all federal claims. Excellent. Okay, so um, once the insurance, uh, what the insurance company did in response to the dentist, the plaintiff suing them, is they counterclaim for fraud. They're like, screw you, this is fraud, we're not paying the money. Um, and they sought to recover the amount already paid, plus punitive damages. They wanted to make an example out of him, you know, for trying to uh, fraudulently, fraudulently get this claim uh, paid for. Um, so what did the dentist do next, um, Attorney Douglas? What type of motion did he file? So because you didn't brief, we're waiting on you to find it in the book. Yes, I'm assuming? I would brief, but I didn't even get that part done. We'll just wait on our attorney here. So again, Strafford moved to what type of motion did he file in response to the insurance company's counter? Uh, stated that they used Rule 9B and said that they failed to identify the lie that he had made. Very good. Okay, so um, filing motion to dismiss, counterclaim. They're like, hey. He's like, throw this claim out, Your Honor, um, because they this claim again for fraud, because they failed to proper, properly apply Rule 9B, meaning they failed to plead the fraud with the necessary specificity, right, um, required by Rule 9B. So I have behind me um, what Rule 9B requires. Essentially, um, it says, in alleging fraud or mistake, a party must state with particularity, so you have to give greater detail. You can't just be broad and say, oh, there was a fraud claim. Um, the circumstances constituting the fraud or mistake. Malice, intent, um, knowledge, and other conditions of a person's mind may be alleged generally, but the fraud has to be very specific about what fraud you're alleging occurred. Um, so there's essentially two parts to Rule 9B. Um, the first part being that for fraud claims, you must plead with particularity the specific circumstances which constitute the fraud. So again, the first part of 9B is that you must plead with particularity the specific circumstances which constitute fraud. One last time, the first step of Rule 9B is to plead with particularity the specific circumstances which constitute the fraud. And second, you can allege malice and knowledge generally. So it doesn't have to be specific. You can allege malice and knowledge generally. So, um, Attorney Douglas, um, according to the court, what does the first sentence in 9B mean? Um, I think it's on the last paragraph on page 404. According to the court, what does the first sentence in 9B mean? Meaning the circumstances surrounding the fraud must be. It requires the time, place, and nature of the alleged misrepresentations. Excellent. So we like that because it's telling us what it means instead of being all vague. So you just need to have to state, as they stated, the time, place, and nature of the alleged representations. Um, in applying that standard to the facts, what does the court conclude about the defendant's counterclaim then, Attorney Douglas? And we'll go back to Attorney Berry after that. Uh, they said it was insufficient under Rule 9B and had to be dismissed, but they gave them a period of time to amend the complaint. Now you're back in rockstar mode. You worried me. I was like, she's going to make me be a KSS. I don't want to be. Um, so I know you're prepared. Excellent, excellent response. All right. So we know the court says um, that the defendant's counterclaim simply failed to identify a statement um, by the shady doctor <laughs> that they claim to be false. That is unclear from the face of the counterclaims whether the defendants asserted that Dr. Strafford's claim losses were improperly plated, inflated, or that the office was never flooded, or not doing a term of the policy. So they're like, we need to know what specific fraud is it all three, but you need to say in the counterclaim with specificity what particular fraud happened, the time, place, and manner. So they really didn't emphasize the manner or the time. So it just wasn't clear enough. Um, and as a reminder, the court says that Rule 9 is. There, the reason we have it um, is to provide the dentist, even though he's shady, um, Dr. Strafford, uh, with fair notice of precisely which statement or which aspect of the claim they're saying uh, is fraudulent. Okay? Because you get a, the reason point for Rule 9 is number one, to help weed out frivolous fraud cases, to not overwhelm the docket. And B, if you're being accused of fraud, I need to know specific enough specificity so I know how to defend myself, right? Um, Attorney Barry, what does the court say about the defendant's complaint in the, in the second sentence um, in Rule 9b, um, which is the top of 405? What do they say? Okay, I think you're perfect to say it one more time. We're almost done. Um, basically, that the second part of Rule 9b, um, the complaint is sufficient. Excellent. And it's sufficient. Why? Because it states that fraud has occurred. 
Excellent job. All right, so the court says the defendant's counterclaim um, succeeds in alleging that the facts, quote, and this is directly from your text, give rise to a strong inference of fraudulent intent. Um, the timing, they said, of Dr. Stratford's claim, again, just 10 days after the policy was reinstated, um, his alleged refusal to cooperate with the insurance company's investigation, and the size of the claim, from 150000 to $1.2 million, um, is, is enough to satisfy that uh, requirement um, for Rule 9. Um, so in terms of the court's holding, um, we know that the court, in this case, agreed um, that the counterclaim, again, was not sufficiently specific, um, but they basically just gave the um, insured insurance company's lawyer um, a brief lesson on how to fix the problem um, and granted him uh, leave to amend uh, the, the counterclaim, leaving Stratford without his dental implants and facing a very long and unpleasant litigation ahead of him with a predictably bad outcome. So um, with the, the court essentially saying, look, we're acknowledging that you did not follow 9B in terms of your counterclaim for fraud, um, but we're not going to just totally throw you out on a limb. We're going to say, you know what, go back, fix it, refile, and we can move on with the litigation. So it's not trying to screw people over that have legitimate claims, meaning the application of Rule 9B. It's just trying to make sure the process is fair so that even though Dr. Stratford is shady, that's for the jury to decide. He has the right to defend himself and he needs to know with specificity, uh, time, place, and manner of the claim so he knows how to prepare a, an efficient or sufficient rather defense. Um, so does Rule 9, do we like Rule 9? I do. Like, even if I'm being shady, it's kind of like everyone has the right to counsel. Like, I still want to know how, um, what I should be defending myself from. And I don't want any, you know, I want to be prepared as possible. So that's all Rule 9 is doing for us today. All right. Um, the next topic that Chapter 6 deals with um, is allocating elements of the claim. Okay? So allocating elements of the claim. Um, so, so far, we essentially assumed two things um, in this class. Um, that we or the court knew the elements of each claim, our kind of claim, and we've assumed basically that the plaintiff uh, had responsibility for pleading those particular claims. And we've assumed that because if you're the plaintiff bringing the lawsuit, I'm assuming that you are responsible for pleading or arguing what the claims are, uh, the different elements. So, um, Interestingly enough, Chapter 6 tells us that none of those two assumptions are necessarily, neither of those two assumptions are necessarily always true. Sometimes the court is not sure who has the burden of pleading particular elements of a claim. Um, but how does that relate then to uh, Rule 8A2, right? Um, who has the burden of proving the elements of a claim can also impact whether or not the party has fulfilled 8A2. Um, remember that 8A2 requires the party to provide a short, plain statement um, showing that you're entitled to relief. And a part of that showing that you're entitled to relief is making sure you plead and address the specific elements of each claim that you're asserting. Um, so the Jones v. Block case, which we will cover next, um, basically addresses the issue of who uh, bears the burden of proof. Um, or rather proving different parts of the claim and how that impacts 82. So again, we are reading the Jones v. Watt case because it tells us who bears the burden of pleading uh, different parts of the claim and how that burden impacts our 82 analysis. All right? Okay, so you did great with the facts last time, so do you mind giving us the facts, Attorney Douglas? No problem. <coughs> Lorenzo Jones was prisoner held in Michigan prison. He suffered an injury while he was in custody and asked to be relocated to a job that would not aggravate his injuries, but the staff refused to reassign him and told him, do the work or suffer the consequences. So he did the required tasks and it ended up aggravating his injuries. So uh, he sued under 42 U.S.C. section 1983, and uh, his case was consolidated with other complaints. Excellent job. All right, so um, the issue then in this case um, is that, as you say, the court consolidated. Um, this case was several others to decide who had the burden of pleading, exhaustion of administrative remedies, as required by, again, this newly enacted uh, Prison Litigation Reform Act, um, which, again, requires exhaustion um, of administrative remedies, but does not address who has the burden of can't talk, burn a plea. Um, so a quick side note on the exhaustion of administrative remedies. So several federal statutes will require that you exhaust your administrative remedies before you can file your case in federal court. So for instance, the EEOC, Equal um, Employment Opportunity Commission. So if I am here at UofL, if I feel like I've been discriminated against because of my gender on the job, I didn't get tenured because I'm a girl, they don't want any more women uh, tenured faculty members here, right? Um, I can't just go and file a case in federal court. I can go and file a case in state court anytime I want. But federal court is probably going to give me a little bit more bang for my butt for a couple of reasons. One, state court, local, localized. They're not trying to, you know, they love your belly. Provides a lot of employment uh, for the city. Um, the judge who's going to hear my case is going to be caring about re-election. If there's a big lawsuit in favor of me where the university has to pay me out, that might not be looked upon favorably. Um, I want to go to federal court. That issue, right? And so, um, in doing so, I have to, if I want to file my claim under Title VII, which is an employment discrimination statute, I have to first exhaust my administrative remedies with that at my place of employment. Um, so that means I have to go through the EEOC first, that's exhaustion of your administrative remedies, and I have to um, let them do their investigation, you know, and they're going to ask me, did you file a grievance at your place of employment? Yes. Did you go through their process? Yes. You know, they said that they, that's not why I didn't get tenure, but they're lying. So the EEOC will do an investigation, and then they'll give me a right to sue letter. That right to sue letter, I can then go to any attorney here and say, I'd like to file my case in federal court, and they're going to ask me, do you have a right to sue letter from the EEOC? Or did you exhaust, did you go through the EEOC's process, meaning did you exhaust your administrative remedies? And I'll say, yes, they'll file the case in federal court. Now, I can exhaust my administrative remedies through the EEOC and still not get that right to sue letter, and still file my case in federal court. But the point is, the idea is it's kind of another gatekeeping mechanism, another layer that you have to go through. And what the hope is behind including that requirement in statutes is that, you know, we'll handle stuff here, and we won't have to go to federal court. Meaning my job will say, oh, we don't need a lawsuit, let's go ahead and rethink this, or they're offering a settlement. So again, it's just another way of trying to minimize the amount of cases that are actually going to federal court if they can be settled and handled um, at a lower level. Um, most employment law attorneys are going to want that right to sue letter because it's basically kind of a stamp of approval. They're like, well, the EEOC says they have a valid claim, let's go. But if the EEOC looked into it and said, eh, it's very hard to get a lawyer to say, okay, yeah, I'll take your case. Um, but you could always find someone if you're willing to pay them, I guess. All right? So that's what they mean by this exhaustion of administrative remedies. And so the issue that the court has to decide in this case is does the plaintiff have to provide facts in the complaint that it has exhausted its administrative remedies, or is it an affirmative defense? Who can tell me what an affirmative defense is? Yes. An affirmative defense is a defense that the also has the burden to prove that they have to prove that it's actually what's the issue where the case is. Absolutely textbook perfect, yes. Um, so <coughs> That's the question. Sorry, I'm doing it off a little bit because you were so precise. So yes, the plaintiff has to so the, 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 the court's trying to decide whether the plaintiff has to provide facts again in the complaint um, that it has exhausted its administrative remedies, or um, is it a, that an affirmative defense that the defendant needs to allege in their answer? Hey, they're trying to the defendant would say, hey, the plaintiff just filed this case against me. They haven't even exhausted their administrative remedies. They haven't fulfilled that requirement of the act. So I need you to dismiss this case, Your Honor. Um, so what specifically, Attorney Bearden, does the
Perfect. And what's the court state's purpose behind this Prison Litigation Reform Act? Why do we even have it? Uh, basically, there's so much before the court's next round. Excellent. All right. So yeah. So basically, just to address a large number of prison um, litigation complaints filed in federal court. Um, to that end, um, Congress basically enacted a variety um, of reforms, again designed to help filter um, out some of the bad claims and facilitate a smoother process for uh, legitimate claims. And so, um, the key among, one of the key features among these efforts by Congress um, was the requirement that inmates complaining about prison conditions again exhaust um, pr their prison grievance remedies um, before initiating a lawsuit. Because you know, every prisoner, not every, but most will be like, I'm being treated poorly. You know, so like, we just want legitimate claims here. Um, so requiring exhaustion basically allows uh, prison officials um, an opportunity to resolve disputes concerning the exercise um, of their responsibilities uh, before being hauled into court. Um, this has potentially reduced the number of inmate suits and also to improve the quality of suits that are filed. Um, who here has seen the movie? It's super old. It's okay if you don't know what it is, but Shawshank Redemption. Oh, no way. That's so cool. Isn't that like such a cool old movie? Like, I love it. Every time I do this case, I think about Shawshank and how he totally screws the, um, the warden over. But you can see why this prison litigation reform act is trying to keep out um, illegitimate claims so that ones like we saw that were obviously very legitimate and Shawshank Redemption can actually get to the court system. All right, so the court's holding in this case was what, Attorney Douglas and Reese? Uh, they said that most courts get failure to exhaust is an affirmative defense, and because claims covered under the PLRA are typically brought under a statute which does not require exhaustion at all, they found that, uh, they, that it would be a uh, beneficial to go with the majority of courts on this case, and that the defendant would have to prove that they had exhausted all of the other avenues. Excellent, excellent, and excellent. Um, so, any questions about this case? Any questions? Pretty clear cut? Yes. I want to try out the, I have the holding contract. So they will, they will guide the burden of proof for failing to exhaust administrative remedies based on, that's the defense, 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 that's the
uh, they said that the plaintiff and some of the defendants are citizens of different states. Yes, so they're implying that on the face of the complaint that there's no complete diversity, right? They're saying, hey, wait a minute, diversity is incomplete. Um, some of the defendants were also South Dakota residents, and so was the plaintiff. So that's what's going on here. So they're saying you're being unethical. You're trying to file a case in federal court based on subject matter jurisdiction, and there's not diversity of citizenship amongst the parties. So what does the defendant do when he realizes that there's something wrong with the plaintiff's complaint? Um, he does what every defendant would do. Uh, the defendant pounced on that basic first-year student mistake um, and sent the plaintiff a letter asking him to withdraw the complaint or you face sanctions. Um, so there's a student I used to have come and speak. He's been too busy this semester, but I'm still begging him. His name is uh, Rudy. Oh, not Rudy's last name. Rudy Ellis, thank you. Um, Rudy loves to tell the story his first year um, in practice that he found a complaint that someone um, filed and realized that they didn't have diversity jurisdiction. He's like, are you serious? He thought it was a trick because it was too easy. So he went ahead and filed a motion for sanctions, and the person's like, screw you, there is diversity jurisdiction. He's like, no, there's not. And so he went before the court and argued that they were really the plaintiff and one of the defendants were residents of Kentucky because their intent to remain indefinitely was here in Kentucky. And he won. He's like, I won. He's like, this is like an older, an older attorney. He's like, I totally won the motion. So he loves to tell the story. He tells it better because he lived it, but um, it does happen. Um, so we know the uh, plaintiff's response um, to the defendant saying, you know, withdraw the complaint or face sanctions um, is after the plaintiff's attorney, uh, Massey, failed to offer any explanation for the defective issues in the complaint. Um, the defendant, um, Northwest, moved to dismiss under Rule 12b1, um, lack of subject matter jurisdiction. Um, and so, um, what does the court do then? So I had mentioned those Rules 12, Rule 12, and we will spend class talking about them, but Rule 12s are different reasons, again, that you can um, do a motion for dismiss, whether it's here is lack of subject matter jurisdiction, lack of personal jurisdiction, um, and so on. And so, um, the district court basically said, look, uh, we're going to grant um, the 12b1 motion to dismiss and sanction, so they, put, they gave sanctions to Attorney Macy under Federal Rule 11 uh, of a total amount of $4,800 in fees and expenses. Um, so the Walkers and Attorney Macy appealed the decision. Um, Attorney Bearden, what did the plaintiffs do wrong in this case? What did the plaintiffs do wrong? And furthermore, what else did they do wrong, attorney? Why don't have a moment? Don't say your name. Douglas. Uh, they didn't look into it at all to see where everybody was from. Um, What's the biggest thing they did do outside of looking into it? Once they were put on notice, what did they do? Oh, they didn't yeah. even change it. Yeah, they, 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 they acknowledged it. it, but didn't change it. Yes, 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 yes. So they brought the complaint on his face, on his face, suggesting again, after some, um, this is what the plaintiffs did wrong, after the jurisdiction. Then they failed to correct the mistake when it was brought to their attention. <laughs> Who does that? That is like ridiculous. And so, um, what could the plaintiffs have done to correct the problem? It would have been really easy just to drop one of the individual defendants, right, and add them when um, you know they saw it desirable. So they could have dropped one of the defendants to create complete diversity. And I know this is kind of like manipulation, but you can always add them later on after the suit has. Well, that's simple too. You can be sneaky and kind of add them as additional defendant later on, <laughs> or they can intervene on their own via Rule 24 because if, if the outcome of the case is not affected personally, so if you have a cold business partner, let them intervene later on via Rule 24 to get in the case, even though it's going to destroy diversity. There's like all these exceptions, but just know that that's why it's a chess game. It's like who's, who's going to outsmart the other person. So it's a lot of strategy involved until you get to. Um, the actual jury to view the case. All right, so what section of Rule 11 did the plaintiff's counsel violate? Um, it's going to be section 11B1. I don't think I put that on the slide. It's going to be section 11B1. Yeah, so that's what section um, that was violated. Um, section 11B2, um, excuse me, that's the section that was violated. So it says under, the, under that provision, counsel has obligated to do enough research to know um, that the diversity jurisdiction alleged and the complaint required complete diversity. Um, 11B2, as you have behind me, provides that the claims, defenses, and other legal contentions are warranted by existing law or by non frivolous arguments. So this claim um, of diversity jurisdiction was not warranted by existing law, and existing law requires that the plaintiffs and the defendants uh, be domiciled in different states. So it's 11B2, um, is the section of Rule 11 uh, that the plaintiff's counsel uh, violated. Um, it's also probably a violation of 11B3, right? Um, to continue to advocate for diversity jurisdiction when the plaintiff's counsel became aware he had no evidentiary support um, for citizenship of some of the parties and the evidence that um, he did indicate some of the defendants were residing in South Dakota. So he could easily point to nothing other than a hope and a prayer at this point um, that these defendants would turn out to be diverse to the plaintiffs. So he basically had no evidentiary basis from the beginning uh, to believe that the allegation of diversity was likely to have evidentiary support. Um, so again, 11B3 could apply as well because he continued to advocate um, for this diversity jurisdiction even though it was brought to his attention um, that there really was a strong basis for that. Um, so we're on appeal here in either Attorney Douglas or Bearden. Um, what were Attorney Macy's and the plaintiff's arguments on appeal? They're still kind of ticked off. Thank you. They tried to say that they shouldn't have had to go through all the effort that would have required, you know, what much effort. <laughs> and they also tried to argue that they didn't have the money to pay the sanctions and that the plaintiff never argued for sanctions, so why were they getting them? All right, and Attorney Bearden, excellent. Do you have anything to add? If not, that is cool. Oh, no. All right, so we have um, essentially what they're saying on appeal. I'm just going to highlight some of the stuff that Attorney Douglas said. Um, that Rule 11, um, essentially, like, look, it doesn't require this kind of um, complicated, in depth um, analysis. And it's, they said it, it's possibly. Um, you know, they just didn't think it was necessary to have to dig that deep um, for the defendant's citizenship before filing the complaint. That's a really weak argument. Um, they also said they felt that the district court abused its discretion um, in awarding monetary sanctions um, since dismissal of the complaint would have been adequate. So why are you giving the sanctions? Just dismiss the complaint. But you, we don't have the money. You're now going to make us pay $4,800. Just throw the complaint out. Um, they said the court should have inquired into the attorney's financial situation. They would have known they didn't have $4,800 to pay. That second argument, isn't that ridiculous? That's goofy. So I'm supposed to inquire me? So they inquire to your financial situation to see, no, we break the rules, I'm going to apply the sanctions. But that's their argument. Um, and they said that the district court uh, based its discretion in denying the request to amend the complaint, abused its discretion uh, when they said, you know what, we're not going to allow you to amend the complaint. Now, remember the previous case, the court was a lot nicer and said, you know what, we're going to allow you to amend that 9B it, um, insufficient part of the complaint, and then you can move on. But here, they're like, this is so basic, and this is like the basic due diligence that attorneys should do. We're not even going to let you, we're, we're not even going to let you amend the case. Like, this is ridiculous. Um, yes. Yes, 100%. So she asked a great question. Could this be considered malpractice? Yes, they, the plaintiff could bring this up uh, through the ABA. This person could possibly get this far because that's, they've just gotten screwed because the attorney's um, inadequacies are. Well, yeah, and I was just going to say, like, one of my favorite quotes from this case is the district court is not obliged to do Massey's research for him, especially at such a late date. I love that. But Massey says, yes, you should. You should be my, my legal clerk, right? And that's a great quote.
regardless of whether or not you can afford to pay them. I don't break the rules. It's kind of like you don't want to go to jail. Don't, don't run the red light, you know, unless you're me. Um, just kidding. I don't run red lights. Just like that's fine. Okay. Um, you know, I want to die. <laughs> but yeah, so um, the district court basically said they're not obligated as attorney general to do the plaintiff's research or lawyering for them. Um, so the court says no abuse of discretion um, and upholds the district court's decision against the plaintiff. Awesome. Um, we've done really well. So like we're like on schedule. We are seven minutes ahead of schedule. I'm so excited about today. Um, and that's it. So tomorrow is Tuesday. So we will continue on um, with our discussion. Um, and I think that's it. I'll see you too. Oh, you need to Oh, you need to Where is it? I got it. Okay. You can leave it there. I'll get it. Okay. Yeah, because it's not fair because prisoners already don't have hope. Yes. So you're taking.